Our Lord indicates that the truth is that we need a king. Regardless of what kind of government we live with, we need a king, and he is the king. Now in the Old Testament, uh, in the, if you read through the four books of the kings, we read of good kings and very wicked kings. But we also learn by doing so that God is the intended king. And when the people decide that they want a king and they insist on having a king, the prophet tells them that God is their king. And since they insist on having a king among men, well, they will suffer certain losses. But nevertheless, God provides them a king. <clears throat> and then, after that king falls, by his own negligences and sins, then another king is anointed, who is to be uh, King David. And from King David, comes a great promise that among his offspring, a king will, uh, will come who will reign forever and his kingdom will have no end. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So any earthly king pales in comparison and yet an earthly king is necessarily religious. There is no monarchy without religion. And a monarch, by definition, is standing in some, in some way in the place of the divine rule, and he answers to God. Now, depending on what religion you're looking at, that monarch is going to be a representative of God's kingdom in some way, regardless of how that religion might define their deities. But among Christian kings, we have the anointing, almost um, as a sacrament. And for some time it was considered the eighth sacrament at a time when uh, perhaps the sacraments weren't quite so clearly defined. Or it was considered a, it, certainly as a sacramental. And in some Christian countries, the king was anointed with the oil of catechumens, which would be the oil of exorcism. In other countries, it was, uh, the king was anointed with the oil of chrism as those are anointed at baptism and confirmation and the hands of a priest are anointed with chrism. And so it was that the king was anointed with chrism in certain Catholic countries. Now, the other thing we consider on this day though, and we hear this in the liturgical texts, is imperium or empire. There is a sense that our Lord is not just a king, but he is the king of an unconquerable empire. And that is the phrase that's used in the blessing of holy water. He is the king of an unconquerable empire. In the collect for today, we have that word, and we also have that word in the, in the epistle. Where do we have, what do we have here? From Psalm 71. The lamb that was slain is worthy to receive the power and divinity and wisdom and strength and honor. To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Well, what does empire mean? Well, an empire would be, in the best sense of the word, a group of countries, each with their own culture, each with their own people, each with their own laws, and over those countries would be an emperor who would promise to defend each of these countries and peoples and their set of laws and to have authority but not power over them. Authority over them, not power over them. Because an emperor or a king is always at the service of God first and the people entrusted to his care in a way, kind of like a priest, but as a layman and concerned with upholding the laws of, the, of that land and not having power over them, but authority over them. So similar to the way a parent is. You parents who have children, you have authority 
over your children entrusted to you, but you only have power insofar as you are serving God and you are answerable to God. And God entrusts you with your children and so you have authority, you rule over your children, but not for your own sake, for God's sake, and you answer to God for that. And whatever power you have, your children should understand that that power comes from God and is only good insofar as you are obedient to God. Children are quick to point out if their parents are hypocrites. So you have to be obedient to God if you expect your, parent, your children to be obedient to you. And that is a glimpse of what kingship means. So we have the unconquerable empire of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that can be compared with this group, with a group of countries over which an emperor rules. Now there are wicked empires such as the Soviet Union and Napoleonic France and all of the other lands that it sought to bring under its rule. Nazi Germany, those are, those are wicked empires. But there are also holy empires, the Holy Roman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, under Blessed Karl uh, of Austria. But those instances of, ki of holy kings might be rare, although there are a lot of kings who, who are saints in the Roman martyrology, a lot of emperors who are saints as well. But when it comes to earthly rule, every earthly rule, every human government will be lacking. And yet, we are to be patriotic. That falls under the fourth commandment, to honor our father and our mother, which extends then to our country. Patriotism is a virtue, and it falls under the virtue of justice. Just as we are to be, just as we are to give God what is owed to him, so we are to give our country what is owed to our country, which is to be a good citizen, to follow its just and true laws, and so forth. But our Lord also has an empire. And what is that empire? Well, it consists of three distinct, three distinct, I guess you could say, places that are under the authority and the power of our Lord. And that would be the church triumphant in heaven, which has its own culture and its own laws, and the church suffering in purgatory, which has its own culture, one of suffering, and consolation, and a great amount of joy in that suffering. And then there is the church militant here on earth, which has its own culture, which we are living out right here in this church and expectations and its own laws. But for instance, the economy of the sacraments don't apply in heaven. There are no sacraments in heaven. Sacraments are for those who are on earth to help us to get to heaven. And on earth, we are citizens of our country the land of our birth, the land where we reside. We are citizens, but we're also pilgrims because our true citizenship is in heaven. And yet we're not in heaven now, although we are called upon to live a heavenly life, even in this life, as a sign of where we truly belong. And so it is said that we're on pilgrimage. We're visiting this land here. And this church, is where we are most at home. When we're in the church, we're outside of time, we're outside of space, we're in the church. And in the church, you could be anywhere on earth, at any time in history, in the Christian era at least, and you're at home. And all the worries of the outside world, well, you might still have them. And those are what we call the attachments to this world. The worries, the distractions, the wounds of sin, 
others, others' sins toward you and your own sins that you have inflicted upon others. Those are all the distractions and the attachments of this world. And we can't take those attachments, those wounds, into heaven. But we're on our way as pilgrims. And so along the way, we have to pass through the realm of our Lord's kingdom called purgatory after this life. And in purgatory, our Lord is so good to us because in that part of his kingdom, he takes away all of those wounds. He heals all those wounds. He helps to detach us from all of those attachments that we just can't seem to let go of. For instance, let's say somebody has hurt you, they've offended you, they've said something cruel to you, and you know you have to forgive them, and you take it to confession, and you confess unforgiveness, and you forgive them, but the hurt's still there. Maybe you hang on to that. The sin may not be there, but the hurt is still there. And that's what our Lord takes away from us when we go to purgatory because we can't take that hurt into heaven. So we need to be praying for, we need to be connected in this, what we call the communion of saints with the entire empire of our Lord's kingdom. The entire empire, which is why we pray to the saints and with the saints to our Lord in this mass and in all the various devotions of the church. And it's why we pray for the dead, especially every November. And it's so important we do so that the church offers us a plenary indulgence for the first eight days of November, merely for visiting a cemetery and praying for the dead. Plenary indulgence, just for that. Because it's so important that we do so. And if you're praying the novena for the holy souls, we're on day four of the novena, if you're praying the novena, it's never too late to start. You've got the whole month of November. You can start today and end in nine days from now. We have lots of copies in the back. And you'll notice that in that novena, you're praying for your own soul. First of all, you're praying to God for your own soul, that you get your own spiritual life in order, and that you would have a holy and provided death. A provided death means that you're not caught off guard that you've been preparing for it, and everything you need is provided, and you're able to receive all that is provided. For instance, the extreme unction, the anointing of the sick, the last rites of the church. Our Lord provides it, but do you receive it? And if you've received it, do you make use of it? Or do you just sort of put it on the shelf and think, well, that's very nice. You've got to use it. So during this novena for the holy souls, we pray for our own souls that we would have a holy and provided death. You have your whole life to prepare for the most important day of your life, which is the day of your death. The whole Christian life really should be preparing for that most important of days. What is more important than the day of your death? There are important days along the way that you'll cherish and remember, but what is more important than the day of your death if you're caught off guard? If you don't have a provided death? If you weren't to have a holy death? If you weren't even to make it into purgatory, then what was it all for? God has provided everything. So have you received it? You have received it. Are you using it for your own advantage? as an act of justice toward God. You have a duty to try to get to heaven, not just to strive for purgatory. If you strive for purgatory, I've said this before, if you strive for purgatory, you probably won't make it. You'll probably end up in hell. But if you strive for heaven, you'll make it into purgatory. And if you make it into purgatory, you'll make it into heaven. That's just how it works. And what a mercy, what a beautiful place that must be even if it is a place of joyful and consoling suffering. So the other part of this novena then is that we unite with the souls in purgatory. We pray for them to ease their sufferings and we also pray to them. We pray to the souls in purgatory that they would pray for us 
in so much as they can. They're not saints in heaven, but they can still intercede for us in a lesser way. And so, when we connect with the souls in purgatory by praying for them and to them, then when our day comes, and all those souls that we've prayed for who've been released into paradise, they are not going to forget you. They're not going to forget those who prayed for them. And they will be praying for you in a special way. And you better teach your children not to give you a eulogy at your funeral and presume that you're in heaven, regardless of how holy a life they might think that you have led. You need to teach your children to have masses said for you. You know, many people arrange ahead of time. And they go ahead and they just pay for the masses ahead of time. They arrange upon their death, in their will, it says that so much money, and I know this because I've read these things that come to St. Stephen's. Upon the, will, the reading of the will, a certain check is made to the church for so many masses to be said for the repose of their soul. And then it's done. And the priest better do it, because if you're following the Novena, you know that there was a priest who was in purgatory for 77 years because he didn't get those masses said. So we need to pray for priests and bishops and even popes that might be in purgatory as well. And then we have the church militant, which is the other realm of our Lord's empire. And after mass today, we are going to pray for that entire realm by praying the act of consecration of the human race to the sacred heart of Jesus. The cross is his throne and he reigns from his throne upon the cross. And the altar is the cross, and it is his throne upon which he reigns. So we will kneel before his throne, and we will pray the consecration of the human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And by doing so, each of you represents thousands of people who will not be praying that today, who wouldn't think to pray that today, because they do not love Jesus. Maybe they even have hatred toward God. So our prayer to God is an act of reparation, repairing the damage done by those who hate God and expressing our love for God and our adoration for God, the true king, because we need a king. Every human being on this earth is subject to that king whether they acknowledge him or not. And not just individuals, but nations are subject to give public worship to Christ the king. And that is not happening. How many nations on this earth would even consider giving public worship to Christ the King? Very, very few. Very few nations. Most nations, even the best, will rarely mention God, if at all, in their laws and their policies, their constitutions. So I don't have, have really an answer to that. Our, our nation is obliged under, as an act of justice to give public worship to Christ the King. And that's not happening. I don't know if that will happen in our country, but our country will have to answer for that, as will every country. And then on the day of judgment, not only individuals will be judged, but nations will be judged as well. So as citizens of this great country, we must be patriotic and serve our country. But we must also recognize that we have an emperor in heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, to answer to. We must do what we can in this land while we are on pilgrimage to make this a holier place and to work toward the kingdom of Christ even in this secular country. We need a lot of grace to do so. And it wouldn't hurt you to apply today's plenary indulgence to yourself. Strengthen yourself. Remember, we're praying this for the entire human race. And how many people who are not praying it? You represent thousands of people, each of you. 
What a grace, what a duty, and what a sweet burden that we are given. Well, let us with confidence and love and trust in our Lord go forward then. We have a great amount of good to do in these coming weeks. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.